one of the most powerful methods that we have for monitoring the well-being of a child is a tool called growth monitoring. When growth monitoring is done all over the world, and when we do growth monitoring, we are measuring three variables. So we're measuring, firstly, the weight of a child, and that's usually recorded at birth, especially if there's a health professional with a scale nearby. Um, secondly, we monitor the length, or later when the baby is standing, the height of the baby. And finally, we measure the head circumference. And each of these, all of these variables together, give us a sense of how that child is growing and how, how their overall health is. So two of these variables, the weight and the length, are usually put, at least in the United States, on the same curve. And you can see that I'm drawing bands. So this is a range of, of normal, and each of these bands, the upper one represents length. So I'm going to write length on the y-axis here. And since we're in the US, that would probably be measured in inches. And then the lower band, this band over here, also on the y-axis is going to represent the weight of the child. Weight in pounds if we're in the US, in kilograms elsewhere in the world. And then on the x-axis, we plot the age of the child. So this would be birth, and then a, a younger child's growth curve or growth chart usually goes up until three years of age, and then their, their data gets put onto a, a, another, a different kind of growth curve. But so this would be one year of age, and this would be two years of age. And then let's just, let's just look at, at these bands and talk about those for a minute. So each of these bands has a middle line, and that middle line is what we call the 50th percentile line. And that means that about half of children will fall above that line, and half will fall below. And similarly for length, we have a 50th percentile line. The, the upper line is usually the 95th percentile, so that means that a child that falls on that line is taller than 95% of the children in that age group, and then the lowest line would be the 5th percentile. So here we have the 5th and the 95th. Okay, so the, the key to these, to these growth charts is that one data point doesn't really tell us much. Let's say we have a newborn who was born, let's say, on the lower end here of, of weight. Let's say normal range of weight would be between about 6 and 10 pounds for a newborn, and normal range of height would be between about 18 and 22 or 23 inches. And let's say that this child was born slightly on the lower side um, and maybe sort of at the 50th percentile for, for height. What we then need to do is as this child grows, with each visit to the doctor, and in the U.S., babies visit the doctor every two months usually at the beginning for the first six months, so we would get a data point, and it's not unusual in that first year for babies to cross percentile lines. Maybe this child would catch up, and by one year of age, this child would be right at the 50th percentile. Maybe this child's height would stay at the 50th percentile. But it gives us an overall picture. All of these data points put together give us an overall reassuring picture of the child's health because of the fact that they're growing along a nice, smooth line. Now, what if we had two two-year-olds, different, different children, and let's say one of them came in on Monday to see you, and this two-year-old was sort of weighing in at the fifth percentile. And the other two-year-old, and you haven't seen either of these children before, the other two-year-old was, let's say, at the 25th percentile. You might think, just looking at these two data points, that if we were going to be concerned about any of these children, we would be concerned about this one here, because this child is right on the bottom line. But what if I told you that throughout this child's two years of life, this child had consistently tracked along the 5th percentile, 
let's say it was this child's parents were small, or there was another reason that this child was just a, a small child, but a healthy small child. And let's say, in contrast, that this child up here in purple, this child had, let's say, been born kind of on the heavier side and had been tracking along nicely along the 95th percentile line. And then let's say that this child's weight had dropped off. And now this would be a very dramatic drop off. Um, but I'm just trying to illustrate a point here. I'm going to move this one up a little bit because it probably wouldn't be so dramatic. But this kind of a drop off, a crossing of percentiles, especially nearing the second year of life when usually children have sort of decided on which percentile they're going to, to stick to, that would be much more concerning than this child, even though this child is at a lower percentile. Now, that doesn't mean to say that if we had two steady curves, let's say the child in green versus the child in yellow, we would definitely be more concerned about the child in green because of the fact that they're so far below the fifth percentile even though this is, this is a, an even curve, a nice smooth curve of growth. So the further below the lowest percentile, the greater our, our index of suspicion or our worry. And yet we do need to have multiple data points in order to make a judgment about whether something's really going wrong with the child. Another thing to note here is that a drop-off in weight is usually kind of an acute indicator. It's a sign that something has sort of gone wrong in the short term. Um, something like diarrheal disease would cause an acute fall off in weight. Only after long standing malnutrition, for example, will a child's height drop off. So let's say this child could have been tracking nicely along the 70th percentile, and then let's say their height dropped off. Now this, this is a concerning trend because we're seeing a drop off in height and we call that growth stunting. Now, why do we do why do we do this? Well, in especially in developing countries, there are three reasons why growth monitoring is very important. Firstly, it allows for a subtle reallocation of the family's resources, even in poor families. When a child within the family is identified as being underweight for age, the family will often just ever so subtly redistribute their, their income to support that child's nutrition. Secondly, if there, if there are sources of external aid available to a community, growth monitoring and identification of children who are failing to thrive or who are underweight for age, that will allow targeted distribution of that aid toward the children who need it most. And finally, growth monitoring serves as a form of education for the community. It makes parents and caregivers aware of the importance of adequate nutrition in order for children to grow to be healthy. So I use the term failure to thrive, and the abbreviation for that is just FTT. And failure to thrive, it's the term that we use to describe a child who has a concerning profile on, on one of these growth monitoring charts. So for example, a child who's acutely falling off or a child who's growth stunted. And failure to thrive has two origins. Firstly, we talk about organic failure to thrive. And organic failure to thrive occurs when there's something physiologically wrong with the child where they are unable to make use of the nutrients that they're taking into their body. Maybe they're unable to digest the nutrients or they're unable to absorb them, but for some reason the nutrients aren't getting to the tissues to help the body grow. The other kind of failure to thrive is called non-organic failure to thrive. And the leading cause of non-organic failure to thrive is malnutrition due to poverty. So in non-organic failure to thrive, the child isn't getting access to nutritious foods to support the growth of that child.